right, so um, I do recognize a couple of you in the audience. Put your hands up if you've done an elective in South Africa. Hands up, more, up, up, up. Okay, good. All right, so I think that's about, sure, 10% of the room. So you, a lot of these things that we're gonna show, I'm gonna show you now, you recognize very well. So we've seen that this headline, nothing, you think food poisoning, all sorts of things. Um, Jen and Sam, you are working at Kailicha Hospital where you did your elective and a young gentleman is wheeled in a wheelchair, he's drooling, he's holding his stomach and he's restless. Immediately what's the diagnosis? Um, in Kailicha land, um, organic phosphate poisoning. There you go, alright. So would that be your number one, well done, <laughs> would that be your number one diagnosis uh, back home? for a young man drooling on a wheelchair, restless, holding his abdomen. You might think withdrawal, substance, all sorts of things. But organophosphate wouldn't be number one. So, <laughs> this is a headline that you might slightly be a little bit more topical at the moment. So what is Novichok? Anyone? It's a weaponized version of organophosphates. And there's different strengths, components, etc. But, um, so why do we see so many organophosphates? We do. Um, one of my colleagues uh, is recently doing an audit. She's halfway through, but <coughs> she's found 118 cases in 16 months at her one small district emergency centre. So this is a very common um, presenting complaint or poisoning in the emergency centre. Um, so the problem is, is that they're really readily available. So as street pesticides, you can buy them online, on the Amazon equivalent in South Africa, you can buy all these things everywhere you go to, public transport stops, uh, informal vendors, they can be purchased. Why? It's very, very cheap and it's a very good pesticide. So you have, you're living in squalor, you have poor surroundings, there is no better pesticide to sort out your cockroaches or rats in your area. So one of the types of pesticide, we get organophosphates and carbamates, which is a very, a lot of overlap on and people often sort of include them in the same category. But one of the, the carbamates, um, the community called two-step, and the reason for that is, is that the rat eats it and takes two steps, and then they're dead. <laughs> All right. And so that says a lot about when you're managing humans with this poisoning. So um, just give you a second to read through that, <laughs> just perfectly timed. So that's our work WhatsApp group th about an hour ago, literally an hour and five minutes ago. Um, so uh, that's me at the bottom. <laughs> Please don't inhale too deeply. <laughs> so, um, that is what um, our local carbamate looks like. He's written carbamate slash organophosphate because we never really know. But essentially carbamate looks just like an organophosphate with, with less nicotinic type effects um, and so forth. So anyway, I just thought that was perfectly timed, uh, uh, retrieved out of a patient's pocket. But that's what it looks like. It's sold in you know, informal packaging often. I showed you a formal packaging in the previous slide, but this is what it looks like. And yes, it does smell like garlic. All right, so what do they present with? Cholinergic toxidrome. You've seen this before in other um, ingestions of other sorts, but nicotinic, muscarinic uh, receptors, pinpoint pupils, abdominal pain, restlessness, um, and this ranges on till seizures, coma, and death. Um, one of the features that Jen probably would have asked the patient to do next with the abdominal pain drooling on the, on the um, <coughs> wheelchair is she would have probably quickly opened his eyes, checked his pupils, found that they were pinpoint and asked him to open his mouth and stick out his tongue. So this is a very common feature to have tongue fasciculations, not, which is not caused by many things. Investigations wise, what do we do? Okay, so if you saw one of these things in your emergency center and uh, one of these in, in uh, poisonings, um, this is sort of what you want to know. Well, <laughs> The one is a blood gas, which can show profound acidosis, which responds very quickly to treatment. Very, very quickly your gas will improve. Hypokalemia is normally from the diarrhea or the imminent diarrhea that is about to occur. Um, if, here's a, a life hack. If you don't want the nurses in your department to hate you, that make sure you say, this organophosphate, please put a nappy on the patient because you're going to regret that soon. Um, so it responds very quickly to treatment. Other testing, 
We're going to check your renal function, sort of the basics, but specific testing, there's a test called pseudocholinesterase. We don't do it commonly. Um, if you've got features of an organophosphate, you've got an organophosphate poisoning, that's that. But if there was some sort of diagnostic conundrum, and certainly in your healthcare system, you do a pseudocholinesterase level, um, which if it comes back low, or zero, confirms the poisoning, which confuses everyone um, when it comes back as high um, or low itself. All right. So, um, what, how do we treat it? We treat it with atropine, 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 more atropine. If you are, don't waste your time doing other stuff because you, you don't have enough people to crack all the vials open. So don't get distracted by all sorts of other things. You, your entire team needs to spend time cracking ampules. How do we do the dosing? All right, we start anywhere between one to three milligrams. Pick what you like. You give your initial dose and every five minutes you double that dose. And that causes great distress because people give one, okay, in five minutes, two, and they give four, and they give eight, and they give 16 milligram boluses, and then they start to feel a bit uncomfortable, and then they just give another 16, and another 16. No, we double with every single bolus. Once you've determined what the patient needed, and our endpoint is a heart rate above 80, a systolic blood pressure above 80-ish, um, and dried out chest, which is our main um, thing we're looking for. Once we've determined that dose, which can be up to 600 milligrams bolus, um, we then get that, we work out 10% of that and we give that an hourly infusion. So what other things are available? And what can happen next? Okay, so what happens with if you give massive doses of atropine? Recognize the mad as the hatter? All right, so the exact opposite toxidrome and your patient starts to become profoundly psychotic, restless, falling off the stretcher because you've given the opposite toxidrome. It's okay. It's just a sign that you need to stop, <laughs> all right, wait. And we often just wait 30 minutes or so, 15 minutes, wait for the psychosis to settle, possibly give them a little dose of benzos, and then we restart the atropine infusion because they'll get sick again, but this time at a slightly lower dose. And it's usually a sign that possibly you're starting to win when the patient starts to become psychotic. So it's certainly something <laughs> you can probably expect, all right. So, what other options are out there? If you go and open Tintinelli or emergency medicine textbook, they'll tell you lots of different options in li search literature. So benzos, your patient's restless. Benzos is a perfectly fine choice. Um, oxymes, you might have heard about, is an option or an antidote. Well, we don't have it available where I work. Um, there is mixed evidence for it. There doesn't seem to be significant evidence to prove that this really makes the biggest difference. There can be some considerations with what we call intermediate syndrome or more longer or me medium term complications. Um, rocuronium, there's some couple, there's randomized control trials in animals that are pending with regards to the use of rocuronium infusions um, and that we're still waiting for results on, but those are animal trials. Um, we would, if we're intubating such a patient, which we don't intubate all organophosphate poisoning because their airway secretions will often dry up. Um, but if they require intub uh, intubation for ventilatory or CNS reasons, we will choose rocuronium over sucks. Sodabic, nah. Magsolf, no. FFP, albumin, clonidine. There's all mixed evidence, doesn't really help. What it does do is it takes away from all the people that need to be cracking the ampules for the atrophy. <laughs> and, and if you spend too much time playing with all these things, you're going to just waste time. So atropine, atropine, atropine. So you, our vials are 0 0.5 milligrams, or they're one milligram per vial. Um, this is from a colleague of mine, Victoria Stephen, who did a Twitter sort of outreach cry for assistance saying, we can't do it anymore. We, we are cracking thousands of ampules per shift. They're seeing many, many, many patients um, per week. And so she actually put a crowd and said, where can I get big ampules of atropine? And via Twitter, someone managed to source a pharmaceutical company that makes 100 milligram ampules. So um, I say check your supply because here you probably don't need to keep 100 milligram vials because it won't be used that often or ever, hopefully. But um, you certainly should make sure that does your hospital have enough atropine to treat one organophosphate poisoning, more than one? It would depend what kind of event occurred that resulted in organophosphate. So where does it come from? Ask your pharmacist, how much is kept in stores? How many ampules do we have if there was an incident where we needed this? So Victor this is Victoria Stephen, those of you that don't know her. Um, <coughs> she also, with you know, seeing the large numbers that we see, she's done out outreach. And it's very important that your role as an emergency physician is not just 
treating the patients that come in. And it can be very soul destroying to just endlessly treat the patients without feeling like you're making any change. She's gone into community radio, speaking out to the community, trying to spread the message, church leaders, etc., etc., regarding how dangerous these drugs are. Now, bearing in mind that these are highly toxic agents, and a lot of a lot of these are parasuicides or suicide attempts, and a lot of patients, um, as you probably have here, have taken overdoses without the significant intent or did not intend for this to be as toxic as it ends up being. So we get a lot of deaths. And if the community doesn't know that you take one, you know, a tiny amount of this, you can, you can and will die. Um, this is huge. So just to spread the message, the same as we have with our paracetamol overdoses. A lot of patients just don't know that they think it's paracetamol or a little bit of rat poison. You know, it's not a big deal. So this is very important, the prevention message. All right, so I'm going to skip straight past that and get to an entirely different um, side of healthcare. So uh, context, so where do I work? I work at Mitchell's Plain Hospital um, we ha and Hedefeld Hospitals. We ha are two district level hospitals, not academic tertiary facilities. Um, and we have four emergency physicians for the two hospitals. So we spread out, not per shift, total. Um, and um, so we are spread over the two facilities. We are considered sort of lucky because we have the most of any other sort of unit. Um, so <coughs> one hospital, it's a slightly bigger hospital. After hours, there's, um, we've got a surgical, I think you call it ST1 or ST2 level doctor available um, on site. Then there's no emergency physicians on premise after hours. We're on call from home um, and um, we see a big burden of patients. The, now this hospital has got surgeons, a surgical ST1 or 2, um, theater, um, and access to a little bit more resources. We also run an emergency center down the road um, that has um, no, only emergency center. Um, two junior doctors, um, pre-registrar um, uh, sort of time, um, and um, emergency physician on call from home. Um, we have no theaters or wards uh, other than a small overnight ward attached. So um, I'm going to pick on Claire Bromley, who was my, a student that did an elective in our department up until recently. Claire, what is that chair? Uh, that's where we put ICDs in. Uh, now, ICDs, not implantable uh, cardiac defibrillator, but intercostal drains, yes. So that is the ICD chair. So um, uh, Jen and Sam will be familiar with uh, probably a similar chair at Kailicha Hospital, but that's the ICD chair. Um, as you come in um, the majors area of our emergency center on the right hand side and that purple doorway is where many many patients enter on a Saturday night. We had massive surges of patients with penetrating chest trauma between the hours of midnight um, on Saturday and I don't know some point on Sunday it slows down. Um, maybe Monday it depends um, and so that's the chair where we put the intercostal drains into um, Claire, after the intercostal drain has been put in, where does the patient go? They walk to x-rays. They walk to x-rays for their post-intercostal drain x-ray. Yeah. <laughs> All right, yes. And then uh, hopefully after that, they uh, maybe um, they will... Triage. They get triaged. There we go, after, the, after their post-intercostal drain x-ray. So d this just explains a little bit the context and how much penetrating chest trauma we see. So no 30-minute target to get into the CT scanner. <laughs> um, they get through the purple door, the security guard takes off their shirt as they enter because they know that we're in a hurry. Um, and then we need to try to sort these patients into patients that, are, uh, patients that have got a minor hemoneumothorax or no, in, no, no thoracic trauma itself, just uh, skin injury, etc. And patients that are really sick and need uh, urgent theatre intervention. Um, so this is where the patients go after we're done with them. So this is the intercostal drain room. Um, now, most South African hospitals, well, a lot of South African hospitals have a room like this. So this is a ward, um, and um, this is where the patients with intercostal drains go to. We, they don't get um, uh, stretches or beds, actually, by our decision-making. Because they mobilize quicker, the intercostal drains can usually be removed in 24 hours, if not sooner. Um, and because they're walking, ambulant, they are doing their own physiotherapy, and at my other unit, which is standalone emergency centre, we don't send intercostal drain patients out. Once we put the intercostal drain in, if it's a simple hemoneumothorax, they get admitted um, to our short stay ward, which is at the back. Um, and they, we have three exercise bikes, and they're expected to um, to uh, to do the exercise and re-expand their lungs, and we'll probably take their drains out in the morning and they go home. 
Does that sound like a slightly different pathway? <laughs> <laughs> um, we, these patients do very well. Um, and but now what happens to the other patients, the ones that don't do so well, the ones that have more serious underlying injuries? Um, we need to make a plan. Now, considering the resources we have available, one is a hospital, we have no surgeons, uh, no access to definitive care. Even at the bigger hospital, we don't have a high care, we don't have an ICU, we don't have a blood bank, and that's at the big hospital. Um, what do we do? So, last week um, was a very good week for me, in more ways than one. Um, but um, I'm going to tell you what I received a phone call from one of our junior doctors that as anyone that's involved in management it makes your heart sink and she's like I've got this patient um, I'm just uh, busy with end of life discussions and everything she's terminal and uh, she's going to die it's a medical patient um, but the family have asked specifically for you by name I know you're not here today but they want to know if they can meet you sometime after the funeral as a manager, you <laughs> that is a very stressful phone call to receive. Um, and um, this is uh, the, the patient that I met. Um, this is actually um, the patient that was um, uh, receiving palliative care, stepson. And um, they wanted to meet me because uh, although they've been busy with this difficult time with the stepmom, they wanted to say that he's just turned one. And the reason they say he's just turned one is that one year ago, just before his mom was being palliated, he had a thoracotomy in our emergency center um, and survived. And now that they were back in the emergency center, it brought all the memories back and they wanted to come and talk to me about it. Um, so this uh, young boy, um, uh, he came to visit me on Friday last week. Um, he had an aortic injury, which we repaired, repaired in the emergency center. The theaters were, were, clo were blocked afterwards. Um, they were, the surgeons were busy with gunshot um, abdomens in theatre and because we have no ICU bed there was, we had to wait um, with, uh, for, to go to um, theatre and this patient I think he waited five hours post thoracotomy in the emergency centre to move out um, and this is him just after his first birthday. Um, so we can do good things with low resources and how, how do we do this? Well, you, say, oh, you have no resource available, how can you do these things? Um, and a lot of people are sort of a bit cynical. They're like, oh, you know, what's the point? It's, you don't have all the resources available, like see the queue kind of thing. So how do we get someone like him to survive? So number one, massive surge of, of patients arrive. Our waiting times are really long. Four junior doctors on duty and night shift, or at the small hospital, two junior doctors busy on night shift. Long waiting times. Patients flowing through the door. Jen and Sam will tell you every five minutes another one's being carried in a wheelchair, carried on a blanket arriving with their own transport typically. Very few of our patients with penetrating chest trauma arrive with ambulances purely because the community knows you need to get to hospital now, you cannot wait, they will find any means of transport possible. Um, so what do we do? At the front door, our security guards know that on Saturday nights they're wearing their gloves and as they come through the door, shirts off so we can at least identify where is the stab um, because likely on top of everything, there good chance there could be crystal meth involved, alcohol, and sometimes it's just a stab wound to the finger and a lot of drama. Um, but um, so we, at the door, whoever's on and, and the closest to the door, quickly put an ultrasound probe on the chest. Oh, pneumothorax on the left. Uh, pericardial effusion. Wait, this patient mustn't just go sit on the chair and wait his turn for the intercostal drain. Maybe we need to act a bit quicker on him. Let's get him space. So number one, triage with the ultrasound probe immediately. You already know, wait, no pericardial effusion. We've probably got a bit of time to play with here. We don't have to rush. Um, oh, wait, there is a pericardial effusion. What next? Quickly, there is no time to waste. So we, as you guys do as well from getting my tour um, of a unit the other day, um, you don't have many empty stretches. Most nights, there's in our department certainly, um, th which is pretty much across the world, there's no empty stretchers. So there is no time to waste. If you can't get that granny off the stretcher, um, you need to act now. So what do we do? Some homeopathic uh, doses of an induction agent of some sort um, and um, a paralytic. Let's get the tube in and both blades at the same time. When you push that induction agent, doesn't matter how low it is and how tiny it is, they're probably going to imminently arrest. So both blades at the same time. Approach. Now, in South Africa, the standard approach is left lateral. In our unit, we try and stick to left lateral for the very simple reason is shorter length of stay, um, less pain, 
uh, less need for ICU. Occasionally some of these patients, when we are in times of extreme crisis, will go to the general ward and you cannot admit a clamshell to the general ward. That's just out of the question. But um, So we try and avoid a clamshell wherever possible. So only if it's a great vessel injury or we cannot get access to the, the, the wound itself. Recovery time is going to be different in a left lateral versus clamshell. Now miniature teams, what do we do with a miniature team? Well, <coughs> you can achieve these things and we do, and we do have survivals um, with good neurological outcome. Currently sitting, I haven't got accurate stats, but about 20%. Um, we, you can do it with a miniature team. Your triaging with the ultrasound probe, doctor number one, I'm talking about a four person team plus some sort of clerk person, so five people. Um, doctor number one goes, puts up an IV line in the one arm. Once the IV line's up, with one nurse goes and sorts out airway intubation, while doctor number two puts up the, the second IV line at the same time, goes to put the intercostal drain in, which we would do anyway, because for us it's a way of salvaging some blood. I'll talk about that just now. Um, put the intercostal drain in, and sort of once the laryngoscope's going in, they're going to open the chest. Nurse number four is helping with the blood, uh, nurse number two is helping with the blood products, etc. And extra person, security guard, porter, whoever it might be, whoever that person is, can put their whole focus on getting the patient warm. Right, so let's talk about blood products. So we don't have a blood bank on premises. In our one hospital, we only have between two to four units of emergency blood available. So what do we do? We give cyclocaprin early. We give FDP, which is freeze-dried plasma, which is kept in the cupboard and doesn't require blood bank or anything. Um, we, um, so TXA, um, we do uh, emergency blood up to two units, but we also do auto-transfusion. Um, so we do auto-transfusion quite a bit, seriously low-tech, but these are intercostal drainage kits that you can see hanging up there. Um, so we've got these disposable sterile uh, uh, intercostal drain drainage kits that have a filter at the bottom. And if you have a massive amount of blood loss, um, disconnect the drain from the patient, put an empty drain on the chest, hang it up, and let, give the patient his own blood back. Uh, we don't do any heparin um, or any other anticoagulation of the blood, and it doesn't clot. Um, so we do this routinely in our front rooms at our two emergency centres. Um, now, what else can we do with regards to preserving blood if we have limited available is don't give the blood till you've got the hole in the heart closed because it's just bleeding out onto the floor. So if you can hold off on your blood products that extra minute and a half, two minutes, just hold off because you don't want to lose more of it. The next thing that is critically important that is often <coughs> sort of ignored is warming the patient. We all know what the triad of sanguination is, but you have to warm the patient. So you could have invasive temp monitoring. I can tell you a patient with sarcotomy is going to be hypothermic. I don't need a, a gadget to tell me that. They're going to be hypothermic. Um, you want to warm them up. So a couple of different ways. Number one, that fifth person, the security guard, porter, whoever it is, must go to the, the air conditioner and turn the heat up till full. No one likes it, but make your recess room like a burns theatre. Make it hot. All right. Number two, Make sure that your fluids and things you're getting are warm whenever possible. Um, and um, also, once you've stitched the hole, the hole in the heart, of, with injury, whatever else, and you've got control of bleeding, wash out the chest cavity with warm saline or fluid or whatever else. It's good use for saline if you're ever looking for a use for saline. <laughs> um, and um, so, yeah, and then body. Once you have now warmed the patient up as much as you can, and you've got control of the bleeding, you've stopped it. So what we have to do for transfers, we need to do some sort of temporary closure of the chest. We can't leave it open. So we will clip, staple, do something with instruments to keep the chest temporarily closed. Thereafter, cover the patient head to toe. Make sure the family don't walk in at this moment because it'll look like bad news. Mm -hmm. But cover the patient, including the head. People often don't like covering a patient's head, but cover them up. You can do everything you can to get them warm. All right, so then what? So I play around on my phone a lot, which I'm criticized for, but um, you need to get these patients moved to somewhere. So um, at the one hospital, it might be to the operating theater, where we're going to do a washout closure and then a weight transfer to a hospital with an ICU. Or at the small hospital, we want to get them transferred via <coughs> EMS to the bigger hospital. So what do we do? Um, well, what's really a, probably not a great idea is to put someone with a pH of below 6.8 
after a sarcotomy that's got a temperature of really low into an ambulance because things are just going to get worse. All right, you've got so, so we try and optimize as much as possible before moving. Otherwise, they will just arrest in the ambulance and they'll arrive DOA on the other side and there'll be some very hypercritical discussions that will occur next. Um, so try and see, do I need to go this very second? Can I wait the extra 15 minutes to get this patient better, <coughs> and more stable and more ready to go? All right, so um, this is a prime x-ray that came from my x-ray department saying best possible. And it's supposed to be supine chest x-ray. <laughs> um, and I was like, you can do better. So just because you have low resources and you don't have um, access to Reboa and TEGS and all sorts of things doesn't mean you can't have good um, outcomes. And um, the best, uh, another nice thing happened, this, I got this photo also just now. Um, this chap had a clamshell thoracotomy on Thursday, um, done at our small hospital um, by myself and my colleagues, um, and my two junior colleagues. And um, he had a pulmonary trunk artery, uh, pulmonary artery trunk injury, as well as a ventricular injury from stab wounds, um, 16 years old. He's gone home. Yes. Um, so we can have good outcomes. So that's him having his apple this morning, waiting for his transport to go home. Um, and he's, he's now currently at home. And that was a clamshell done on Thursday at a facility with no blood bank, no surgeons, no theater, um, and with a great vessel injury. And you can have good Bad outcomes. Bad oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you can do it. You can do better. All right. Um, so this is me. Kat Evans, now I'm in a small punt here. I'm from the Bad EM blog. I don't know if, if any of you have heard about um, Bad EM Fest 18. It was an awesome event. Lots, there were a couple of people in the room um, here that were there. It's great fun. We are going to be replicating this even better in 2020, March. Exact dates to be confirmed. <laughs> but um, Bad EM Fest is a festival themed get together in South Africa, just outside of Cape Town in the mountains. and um, we, uh, there's currently no one that's tweeted yet with this hashtag, but um, I hope to see you all there. Um, come have some fun with us, have brave African discussions in emergency medicine, which is what Bad EM stands for, um, and let's share ideas and see how we can come up with solutions to each other's problems. Thanks.